So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Vanessa Scott, and I'm the director of the Start Blue Accelerator program. And I also lead industry relations and innovation here at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UC San Diego. We are very excited um, for tonight as we showcase the startup teams that are currently participating in our second cohort of Start Blue. Start Blue is the newest track in the Rady School of Management's Start R Accelerator programs and represents the latest collaboration between Rady and Scripps in an effort to expand on San Diego's blue tech ecosystem by providing a unique opportunity for early stage ocean-based startups to incubate. I'd like to start by thanking all of our sponsors and partners for their support and expertise without which we could not be running this program. So thank you to all of you. And a huge thank you to all of our program mentors for their dedication to our teams during this first portion of our program. The growth and support that we offer our teams are in large part due to the expertise and advising that our mentors offer as volunteers. And we are extremely grateful for your time and dedication. So thank you. In addition, I'd also like to, stay, to thank the Start Blue staff team. We are small and mighty. Uh, Karen Jensen, program manager and entrepreneurship advocate at Rady School of Management. John York uh, with Rady School of Management and our lead instructor for the fall program, who's been getting everybody up and uh, ready for the showcase tonight. Chris Ward, who's our executive in residence and oversees our mentor program. Canon Purdy, our innovation liaison, and Jordan DiNardo, our student fellow. Thank you to all of you. And we are super excited to introduce you to the teams tonight. They have spent the first portion of the, I guess the last three months uh, of the program under the tutelage of Rady adjunct professor, John York, exploring their customer discovery, developing their business models and refining their business plans and stories. What you'll see this evening are brief presentations from each team representing kind of this first phase of their journey through Start Blue and the plans for the second half of the program. To note, this is not a formal pitch presentation, but more of an update on their progress and their goals and any ways that you can help them continue their journey. Um, we will have time five minutes uh, after each presentation for you to ask questions, comments. So please feel free to unmute yourself or enter things in the chat. If for some reason we won't have time to get to your questions uh, today, we encourage you to reach out to the teams individually and they will be sharing their contact information on their slides and through the chat as well. So we really appreciate your attendance and are very excited for you to meet our teams. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce our first startup uh, for the showcase, Amphrotite Robotics with Antonella Wilby. And I will hand it over to you, Antonella. Looks good. Okay, thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Antonella and I'm here representing Amphitrite Robotics. Our company's mission is to develop cutting edge autonomy software and underwater robotic hardware to automate applications in marine technology from aquaculture to an infrastructure to marine exploration. I work as a pilot for deep sea ROVs or remotely operated vehicles. This is one ROV that I work on, ROV Hercules, which is used worldwide for deep sea scientific research down to 4,000 meters. ROVs are widely used across multiple marine industries, including oil and gas, pipeline inspection, offshore renewable energy, subsea cables, and a lot of other industries. Uh, these are an incredibly valuable tool, but they're also incredibly expensive. They require large fuel hungry ships and large teams of qualified people to operate and maintain them. For example, um, this vehicle has four people on the operational team at all times, which with a 24 hour rotating watch is a minimum of 12 people, not including the science team. 
In my other onshore life, I'm also finishing my PhD in marine robotics, focusing on autonomous mapping and navigation with underwater cameras. My work has focused on handling the complex environmental dynamics of marine environments to improve the capabilities of mapping and nav navigation algorithms underwater. My experience bridging these two worlds has led to a multiple opportunities for automation of marine industries that currently rely solely on ROVs. Thus, Amphitrite, Amphitrite Robotics was born. We're a small team and we're just at the beginning of our journey. So participating in the Start Blue program has been invaluable for learning foundational skills for how to start a company and making sure that the solution that we're offering is commercializable and has enough market potential to grow a company. This fall, we focused on developing and refining our objectives and key results and conducting customer discovery across multiple market sectors. Through this process, we identified several market opportunities, refined the value proposition we're trying to offer, and also applied for some grant funding. Our team brings a diverse skill set to the table. We have significant experience working in offshore engineering and ROVs, field robotics, mechanical engineering, software engineering, control systems, and manufacturing. We're also offering significant technological value propositions, specifically software that's designed for navigation in dynamic underwater environments, rather than just trying to use what's developed for the terrestrial world underwater. We also want to provide annotated data sets of underwater imagery, oceanographic sensor data, robots as a service for automated underwater monitoring and inspection, and subsea components, including cameras and actuators. Down the line, we want to upgrade the current prototype vehicle to offer an integrated hardware and software package. We've identified three overarching market sectors with significant opportunities for automation, um, aquaculture, infrastructure, and marine exploration. Shellfish and fish aquaculture are already pretty profitable industries that may provide a lot, um, several avenues for commercializing our technology. Um, kelp and seaweed aquaculture seems to be really up and coming. Um, and hopefully that'll increase in a few years. Right now, the industry is kind of um, in its infancy, I think. Infrastructure likely provides the most opportunities for automating inspection, especially in offshore wind and renewable energy, subsea pipelines and cables, and infrastructure security like dams and tunnels. And finally, marine exploration contains several niche markets that probably individually offer less opportunity for profitability and scalability, but still offer several interesting smaller applications like in scientific research and conservation and underwater cinematography. Our 2023 timeline starts with establishing a corporate entity. We're not yet officially incorporated and we need to finish this before we can apply for super grants and other government grants. In March, we're taking our prototype vehicle to, to Japan um, to run some field trials of coral reef monitoring. Moving on to the second quarter of 2023, we'll be continuing the customer discovery process and working to establish partnerships with demonstration customers, um, ideally both in aquaculture and infrastructure. Later on in 2023, we're planning to deliver a updated, refined version of our mapping software with the goal of executing a product demonstration with partner cu customers in infrastructure and aquaculture by the end of the year. So customer discovery is still a large part of the stage that we're at, so we would love to talk to anyone about possibilities for automation in your industry. So if you or anyone you know has experience in any of these areas or any others, um, we would love to talk to you. Um, also, once we get initial funding, we'll be looking for partners for lab space and field testing, manufacturing, and demonstration customers. So my contact information is below. Um, shoot me an email if you want to chat about Subsea Robotics. Thank you so much, and I'll take questions now. Excellent, thank you so much, Antonella. All right, so please feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask Antonella a question or drop your question in the chat, and we would be happy to have her answer it. Vanessa? Yes, John? Yeah, so I have a question. So Antonella, if you look at your journey from about six weeks ago, where you're at and where you're at today, what do you think might be one or two major learnings that you've gained through this effort and maybe one challenge and how would you handle it? So I think one of the most important things that a lot of um, people have emphasized in this process is really figuring out what you're trying to do before you try to like actually set out to do it. So I you know there are a lot of examples of startups that have failed because they 
had a thing, but no one really wanted it. Um, so I know on my market opportunity slide, I kind of had a lot of things listed there. Part of that is because we're not trying to do everything. While um, a lot of the like automated navigation and mapping could be applied to multiple areas, we haven't really decided on a niche to really focus in on yet. And so I think that's one of the most important things that, that we have taken away from this is really early on taking that time to, to really figure out what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the challenge, honestly, is, is has been funding and trying to like get just get get started. There's a lot of you know startup costs involved with this, so that's been one thing. Also, that's been very helpful in this process is learning about resources from our mentors and from the program of you know how to get access to ways to do this without requiring you know a huge amount of funding before you even can start applying for grants and stuff. Okay, thank you. And now I see a question that came in through the chat as well. Peter's asking, what niche would you say your potential ROVs play and how are they different than other ROVs on the market? Yeah, so basically we're looking towards autonomy, right? So a lot of ROVs are on the market. We have big work-class ROVs like I showed. Um, we have smaller ROVs like the blue ROV, which is the second ROV I showed is a very modified version of that. Um, and those are great and they have a lot of applicability, but they require humans to be in the loop at all times. We're using an ROV as a prototype because underwater, working underwater is really hard, it's really expensive, and those are the vehicles that exist. But we're looking towards the future of actually having these vehicles be either semi-autonomous or entirely autonomous. So we're focusing on the software and developing the mapping and navigation right now. Right now, most ROVs really, um, they have cameras, they have sensor data, but they're not doing anything with that. They're not trying to navigate autonomously. So we're not really trying to build another ROV. We're trying to look beyond that um, to having autonomous capabilities that you could either put into an existing ROV or put onto a fully autonomous vehicle. Great, thank you, Antonella. Any other final questions for Antonella? All right, well, thank you, Antonella. We appreciate your presentation. And next up, we will hear from Eris Photonics, led by Babak Bahari. Hand it over to you, Babak. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, do you see my slide now? Perfect. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Babak Bahari from Eris Photonics Startup Company. Uh, in our startup company, we work on developing uh, LiDAR systems for different applications, especially for Bluetooth, which is the scope of this uh, program. And uh, basically, we use uh, we develop LiDAR systems for, for example, monitoring pipelines or cables on the water, oil, oil spill, uh, tracking uh, trashes, either visible or invisible. And in general, for mapping uh, surface um, and ground under the water or out of the water for coastal lines. Uh, at the beginning, when we joined to this uh, program in the start blue, uh, we generated this uh, triple chasm graph you see in the right. And we realized that we are good at some uh, technical aspects. We know what technology we have, what application it might have. And also we generated some IPs to protect our technology. But also on the other hand, we realized that we need to work hard on business development and the type of service that we are going to offer to customers, customers discovery and finding investor funding. Uh, we generated uh, some uh, OKRs uh, in three major areas of prototype uh, development, customer discovery and fundraising. Uh, these OKRs actually we use them as a, a business map for developing our startup within the next 12 months. But depending on what's around the corner, what's around the corner, we uh, can generate more OKRs, make some changes there on them and uh, do more works. Uh, one of the major achievements that we had in this startup, in this Start Blue uh, program was identifying value proposition. We focus on different customers, especially here, I listed two of them that we did research, oil company and fire department. For example, in oil company, we realized that they suffer from some pains, which is oil spill and its uh, consequences. 
in human, animal, or plant life hazard affecting ecosystem. It can enter into the food chain and poison human and animals. It's very difficult to detect and it has some related penalties to government and some insurance problems. Basically, the LIDAR systems that we have for blue tech, it can be used to detect very fast and real time before oil spill becomes a, a huge disaster. It can save lives and ecosystem. It can reduce the money that we spend, especially for cleaning uh, oil spill. And it, it can prevent uh, wasting uh, resources, such as oil and losing animal and plant lives. Uh, or technology um, has uh, lots of abilities. Uh, basically, LIDARs are uh, optical sensors, which are super sensitive and can be used for mapping smoke detection and in general, underwater surveillances with many applications. For example, in oil spill detection, underwater to the mapping, ship navigation, uh, biodiversity study and smoke detection. These are just few applications it, among the other uh, tens of applications it might have. And it can lead us to different customers in different sectors, in oil companies, seaports, coast guards, ship companies, fire department, and Cal Fire. Uh, what, uh, where are we today? After two months interaction with the Start Bloom, now we have a clear businessman by developing some uh, good OKRs. And also we have some strategies to develop our business and make it more mature. We can define the services that we can offer to different customers. Uh, also, we have some strategies to connect to different customers as our, uh, right now we are already connected to two different customers through this uh, program. And we have good strategies for raising funding in 2022. And for the next four months of this program, we are going to expand potential customers and collaborators and refine market opportunity. And more importantly, secure some fundings uh, as we receive some calls for government or uh, private sector companies. Um, how you can help? Basically, we need your help to develop our business model beyond the thing that right now we are. And also, if you can uh, introduce us to potential customers, especially in sectors of offshore energy, maritime security, and fire departments, or any other relevant sectors that they, you think that they need uh, uh, this kind of LiDAR systems, and also help us to become partner or with some uh, investors or collaborators uh, that can work together. This is our team. Currently, we are six working on different aspects of this project. Uh, some, of them, some of us are full-time and some of us are part-time uh, working together. And this is my contact information if you have any question or if you can help us in future. Thank you so much. So Lynn, thank you so much, Babak. All right, so we've got five minutes for questions from the audience for Babak. Please feel free to unmute yourself to ask a question or put them in the chat and I'm happy to read it off. Ah, okay, we got one from Nick. Uh, Babak, how far will LIDAR travel underwater versus how far on land to detect smoke? So, um, you know, underwater, 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 basically the range of LIDARs are in the range of 100 to 200 meters. But uh, out of the water, it can be in the range of kilometer. We haven't range yet, uh, but theoretically, these are the numbers that uh, we can achieve using the laser, the laser system that we can in North Yeah, uh, Babak, when when uh, you think about your your product offering, which is uh, like a, a semiconductor chip, um, and you think of the scale that you have to come up with to deploy that successfully, right? You have to eventually have it made at a chip factory. Um, how, what are your thoughts on, on the volume that you're gonna be able to create in the marketplace and, and how that's gonna impact your choice when you come to manufacturing? So I assume that the volume you are making, you're basically asking that uh, how much of the market we can occupy. Well, I guess, I guess I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, that you need like hundreds of thousands of these to, uh, B6, you know, to, to deploy to a facility that's going to manufacture them, right? Uh, in order yes. to get a good price, right? So yes. I guess in your in your work that you've done to start blue or elsewhere, do you do you have a vision of getting to the numbers like that? Yes, the numbers actually depends on the market that we are targeting. Obviously, targeting markets like Autonomous, which is a very famous one, is challenging for us as a startup. Uh, we target some environmental related sectors, which is very easy for us to put our steps there. And 
those uh, sectors are not very large as autonomous vehicle. Uh, maybe maybe if we generate thousand in the range of thousand per year, which is actually achievable, especially with the partner that we have, uh, this helps us put our steps there and become more mature. And then we target bigger markets. But the market, the size that you are saying that thousand dollar thousand uh, products um, in foundries is achievable. This is something that at least the foundry that we are working, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Great, we've got another question that came in from Peter. Regarding oil infrastructure, is the goal to generate a 3D map of infrastructure such as underwater pipelines? And can you do wide area surveillance to find leaked oil or is this meant more towards finding damage? And how would your sensors be deployed? Okay, so the finding damage is one thing and detecting oil is still another thing. Right now we are focusing on detecting, detecting oil is still than finding damage. Uh, basically, the strategy is there are some uh, sites, oil sites. We generate, we make lidar systems to monitor a water surface in those oil sites up to let's say it is in air, it is not inside the water. From the air, uh, using some towers, it can cover up to a kilometer, uh, the radius of kilometer, one kilometer. Uh, if there is a oil, even the size of nanometer. It can detect it. This is in the back. In, I want to just give this information also. Right now, detecting oil is mainly by visual than using instruments. If the oil becomes uh, thick enough and broad enough, it's visible to detect. But LiDAR system can detect it even if it is very small. For pipelines underwater, basically, you are making, you are trying to make a grid. Grid of coupled LiDARs mounted on, on the pipelines, and all of them are connected using the fiber optic. So 24 hours, seven days, it can monitor upper surface of the pipeline. If oil comes out, oil go, tends to go upward toward the surface. So when oil comes up of, out of the pipeline, it can be detected using this LiDAR. And since it is connected uh, network, we can detect which LiDAR is alarming. So the location of that oil leak can be detected very fast. Great, thank you, Babak. Any other final questions for Babak? Vanessa, it's John. Um, Babak, what, what do you think was your major accomplishment that you had? And again, what would be your biggest challenge going forward that you'd wish to address? So um, uh, at the beginning, before joining this program, basically our major challenge was in the marketing side and business development side. Uh, now we kind of try, we are kind of solving this issue after interaction with the Star Blue. Now we have a vision. We are not working in, in the dark. Now we have some vision. We identify the, uh, the target customers, how we can uh, connect to them. And in future, we are going to strengthen this part. Because in terms of engineering, we are a bunch of engineers. We know the product, how to make it, how to reduce the cost, how to increase the efficiency, whatever technologies. But for business part, which is our major challenge, we are, we are trying to make it stronger in the future. Okay. I'm really impressed with your improvement to the program. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Babak. We appreciate it. And uh, Peter, I see your additional question, but I would say just for time purposes, I would uh, suggest and connect you to Babak for uh, further questions afterwards. Um, next up, we're going to be hearing from Berkeley Marine Robotics, led by Sushil Tiagi and Alex Ima. So um, we can see your Hi, slides. But they're can, not... you see, can you see your slides? Yes, but they're not in the presenter mode. Okay. Well, let me go with it for now. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Sushil Tiagi. I am presenting the Berkeley Marine Robotics. And yes, we are rocking Berkeley loud and proud, but being a UC, I suppose we are still the home team at Scripps. So I will just go with that. Um, we are, first of all, just give you the word about the founders. Quite obviously, this is links to Berkeley. I did my degrees in ocean engineering at Berkeley a long time ago. After that, I went to business school and worked in corporate finance and management consulting, but I have been always uh, coming and mentoring people at the ocean engineering department. And I met 
Alexander Immers. He just finished his PhD in underwater robotics and was working on swarm underwater robotics as well as wireless underwater communication. And we thought that could lead to some very exciting opportunities. So we are working on a very immediate beachhead market that we found which is a problem that ships, when they have biofouling, they get slow, start to use a lot more fuel, emit a lot more greenhouse emissions, as well as have invasive species. And as a result, they need to have a much better optimization plan that can reduce all that significantly. But right now, there's no data because right now, either they're too late and lose all those fuel and, and CO2, or they're too early, which can lead to delays and damages. And there is no proper underwater data at the, at the frequency and the speed at which they need it. So we started to develop a solution for it. When we started our journey at, at Start Blue, we had already been to NSF i -Core program, had done customer discovery with the grant. We started to build the R&D and uh, the, and the prototype, but we still need to have a focus on many different segments of underwater inspection and the commercialization path. What we found working with Start Blue and with, with John York and all the classes with Chris Ward, we started to see how the different segments, as much as they are attractive, we need to work on an immediate revenue opportunity in the inspection uh, at the port. And after that, start to scale up by creating prediction models so that we use that data at scale to create predictions. And then after that, we can start to work on the dual use with the defense who may have much more critical requirements, but that may be a little too far and, and too long in the way for specs to, for us to get right away. So that helped us get to that path. Also, in terms of the OKRs, we started to see that our next step really would be to launch a pilot with the industry partners. And for that, we'll need to raise the money to complete the prototype, have LOIs with the diving companies and ship companies, and start to generate data with the function prototype, and then start to do, raise our next one for with the corporate VCs and grants to do a proper paid pilot project. Our current stage already is that we, as we have been working through this at TRL five or six readiness, we have most of the components, including the laser wireless communication and the swarm control and autonomy of following a ship that is being done. We have done initial field tests in Long Beach port with the industry partners. We were selected at the IMO tech showcase uh, to, to show it to other countries at Innovation Summit at the Biofouling Challenge in Spain. And so we are working on all of that. Uh, what we are really seeking advice on most of it is that given that we are already in this path to build this prototype, and in order to get the next stage will be the LOIs with all the industry partners with whom we can do this testing and start generating data. We need you know, advice both on trying to reach grants that are perhaps non-government and could come earlier, as well as the innovation departments at various uh, shipping and other uh, companies who may be more interested in being the first customers and treat it as their own little competitive advantage to have this kind of data that we'll be generating through our process. I really appreciate anybody's help and I thank you and I'll take any questions. Excellent, thank you so much, Sushil. All right, we've got five minutes for questions for Sushil. So please feel free to unmute yourself and or enter your question in the chat and I'm happy to read it off. I'm sure my instructors have questions for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I say you just did such a comprehensive presentation. Well, I'm going to ask the same question. So as previous, what do you think is your biggest accomplishment and learning? And um, what do you still see as the challenge um, going forward? Absolutely. I think first is I really appreciated the Star Blue mentor program in which we were able to really assess where the dual use in defense really can go. Because, you know, if on the surface, if you tell somebody you're building underwater swarm robots that can com communicate wirelessly, immediately people say, this should be something to do with military or defense. And, and suddenly it becomes kind of a red herring and all of a sudden people are discussing that. It helped us really assess it, what that really is. Meaning either it's an, totally an adjacent opportunity where they look at the Navy ships biofouling and come up with the data to help them manage their ships, or things would be way too far in kind of an application that'll be purely for defense and those specs will be too far out and we cannot really be planning on those. So that was a good learning that we don't have to think of it as kind of a another 
big, huge thing that we are missing on the side. No, we have it right away as we are doing our data collection. We'll be able to also approach through our mentors the Navy program and show them how this kind of data can help them. Um, and yeah, and, and in terms of the the challenge, the challenge in these kind of a deep tech projects is that when you are working on it challenging problem like underwater wireless communication, which is really the, the cutting edge and many, many companies are, are trying and not very many are there already. So in that, what happens is that you can do R&D and kind of get all the way up to a bit of a prototype. But then when you are talking to the industry, they want to see something that's ready. That's, you know, they want to see, throw it in the water. Let's see if it does it. And there is a bit of a gap between the two. And so therefore needing those uh, those those grants, those supportive organizations who say, look, as much as it's for the ships to reduce the fuel and CO2, it also helps with invasive species, it, it will help everything else. So we want to support this under the decarbonization effort and sustainability effort, and therefore help us take it from that prototype to the commercialization stage. And I think that would be the, the challenge, and I'm hoping in the next phase of this program, we'll get a lot of that, that help. Okay, super, thank you. So Sheila, there's a couple of questions uh, that came in the chat too. The first from Nick asking, how many robots do you need to swarm and clean a ship? Okay, so the idea is that first of all, I would mention that we are not doing the cleaning at this phase. It's a, it's possible, but because we are still building the situation that is an autonomous swarm system that works together, holds its position and is able to communicate, but then we can put any sensor on it and we can put any kind of device on it to do whatever we need to do. But the idea really is that it depends on the turbidity of the water, that if the water is relatively clean, you can have a fewer and still get a full coverage. Uh, also depends a little bit of the size of the vessel, but we believe that somewhere between three to six would be the extent of the swarm they'll need to be in order to cover it. Right now, we do a lot of prototype testing with just two, because as long as working with two, that can be extended further. But we also believe this is not like a, you know, 50 or 100 of them. So it's still under 10 in any case, and it'll depend on exactly the vessel and exact uh, product market fit when we get down to the features that what is really the ideal size of the swarm. Excellent. There's another question from Peter. You've answered part of it, but he also is asking, are you developing software to automatically characterize the level of biofouling on a hull, and how will the data be collected? Absolutely. You know, this is actually a, a, a great question, honestly, because even though people can do get a lot of data and kind of claim AI and, and machine learning, really it's the standardized data that is collected the same exact way every time. And it's a it's an exact scan that takes place. That is the right kind of data that trains the machine learning models. So what our aim here is that as we start to generate data, we are already developing the rudimentary system for both detecting invasive species in these scans, as well being able to develop of those metrics that tell us what the roughness index is, how has it changed since the last scan? Because the value of this kind of system is that you're getting frequent data and goal here is that you scan it within a few minutes. It's not like something like a whole day is taking place as will happen with, with divers or ROVs or anything like that. So it's a very quick data. And based on that, such a scale of data that you're creating, you're training a better, better model for being able to predict as well as assess very quickly as to how far the biofouling has changed since your last track and being able to flag any damage, any contraband, you know, any kind of other anomaly that also will be helpful to the defense and in the dual use. Excellent. Thank you so much, Shushil, and thank you everyone for your great questions. Um, I'm excited to hand it over to our next startup team, Coil Reef, that is led by Roger Benham, Noah Brown, and Ben Smith. I'll hand it over to you. <clears throat> Looks good. Uh, 1940 was the year my great grandfather built a house on the beach of modern day Oceanside. At the time, he thought it was in the perfect location, but oh, was he wrong? Beach erosion has plagued Oceanside, ripping the sand from the coast, leaving thousands of homes at risk of being taken by the Pacific. These are pictures of sand levels in the 1950s and the in 2000. And this is a picture of last November at low tide, might I add. This is one issue for Oceanside. 
but it's also a huge issue for Del Mar and San Clemente facing similar problems with the Amtrak train that's also at risk of falling into the ocean. We believe we have a solution to this problem. Or Coral Reef, led by Roger Benham, a professor at Cal Poly, along with Ben Smith and myself, Noah Brown, for both Scripps majors at UCSD. Uh, what is coil reef? Uh, coil reef is a removable reef system to address beach erosion problems, enhance aquaculture and carbon sequestration needs. Coil reef is a roll form shape structure of any diameter. In our opinion, the coil reef structure shape is the most efficient means of creating surface area. And surface area is what you need to accomplish these desired goals. Uh, the coil reef is made of out of titanium. Why? Because it has nil corrosion. Uh, and it is also bio biocompatible. And then also uh, it is uh, easily constructed in the roll form shape and advantages with the joining methods. Uh, we believe it'll prove to be the most economical material to make reef structures compared to other materials. <clears throat> and next slide. Next. Sorry. So through Start Blue, we identified some of our strengths and also areas where we needed to grow. Um, our strengths included technical expertise, I, IP management, we have an active patent on our design, and then we've also identi identified markets where we, thought, where we see ourselves fitting. Places where we need to grow include business strategy, which also includes creating a, a, a strong business model, discovering customers, and then exploring funding and investment opportunities. So these were our initial goals um, with Star Blue. It was to gain connections and to network, meet some people around San Diego and around California who were interested, um, determine our customers, and also once again, finding out how to get funding for our project. We determined our value proposition through research initiatives as well as customer interviews and came to the realization that our product offers a removable, low cost and easily constructive constructed alternative to erosion mitigation technologies, aquaculture substrates, and marine habitat enhancement. We feel that no other solution to these problems can achieve such a low cost solution like ours and still have the ability to remove it when necessary. Coral Reef inherently has so many applications. At the beginning, we had issues figuring out what would be the best fit for our product. Going through the program, we discovered three main markets we wish to target, beach erosion mitigation, marine aquaculture, and having it be a standardized test sale for biogrowth, similar to how agar is used for biology standards. Standards. We narrowed the markets we wanted to pursue. However, we still need to pursue with customer discovery to see where our product would do the best. So our goals for the next year include increasing customer interviews and outreach by identifying and pursuing new modes of funding, and also to get our, our product into the water so that we can validate Coral Reef. And it's honestly just interesting to gather data and see what we can, we can discover. So next we have identified milestones for the next year. And we have prototypes in the water already through other sponsored research, but we would like to get prototypes uh, in the water locally uh, by March of 23. And then skipping ahead to June 23, uh, we have a presentation with the Start Blue Showcase uh, that uh, uh, we look forward to. And uh, by July 23rd, we feel we can have uh, production and deployment uh, presentation, actual the cost of machines and the cost per mile or whatever unit for the cost of, of applications. And then by September of 23, we'll be starting, we look forward to starting an application process for the Port of San Diego incubator program. In conclusion, uh, remember when you were a child and you would make fun and exciting little habitat creations for your pet fish or lizard or whatever you had, maybe 
little caves and sandy trails or a little perch. Well, as a society, we are reaching the limits of our coastal land use. Yet before us is a huge expanse of open sea floor. Now open sea floor I'm referring to are this areas of sand bottoms, void of vegetation uh, outside of the coastal littoral zones. We are asking you to unleash your, the child within you uh, to help us turn these vast sand bottoms into thriving ecosystems and at the same time uh, address hundreds of millions of dollars of beach erosion issues, provide aquaculture opportunities and other benefits. Coil Reef is a powerful tool and please contact us by means of the link shown here. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Coil Reef. All right, we've got five minutes for questions and we've got one already in the chat. So Peter is asking, how actually does the Coil Reef product work in terms of erosion control? Uh, what a Coil Reef does is it uh, dissipates wave energy by what is called destructive interference. Uh, in other words, uh, we are going, what it does is it turns the wave energy onto itself. And so waves uh, propagate through the ocean uh, by means of a known wavelength. So at a certain size of coil reef, on one side, it's impinging in, in uh, one direction where on the other, it's the opposite direction. And by this means, uh, the coil reef does, it, it can be self-anchoring and dissipate wave energy. We sponsored research at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. They did a great job in a wave tank and using um, uh, calcula, cal, uh, models, computer models to demonstrate uh, the, uh, and, and, and showed uh, that we are effective. Great, thanks, Roger. Any other questions for Coil Reef? Please feel free to, oh, here we've got one from Jayanti. Uh, please describe your on-site manufacturing capability. Oh, thank you. Uh, I guess I'm gonna answer that one too. The roll forming uh, uh, method is widely used and it's a series of rollers. We, we purchased a roll forming machine that we can make our prototypes and the test cell that Noah referred to. Uh, so uh, this is in a shop for a small coil reef uh, substrate or test cell. Uh, in the field, what uh, it would be constructed, it would include a, a, a truck with pallets of strip material. Then the material would be loaded into a, a roll forming shape uh, machine that's on a barge. And if we were at that scale, you know, I'm off a general answer here, but we could basically extrude and roll form and eject coil reef of, let's say 30 feet diameter or whatever diameter continuously. And uh, there would probably be robotic spot welding and it would uh, come out the back. But we feel that is a real important feature of coil reef where we could cover a little, a literal football field with just one truckload of pallet of, of the strip material. Hey, Vanessa, can I ask a follow-up question? Um, super interested to know, in addition to the question I asked about erosion control, uh, have you thought about um, if you put these in the water impacts to marine species? What we uh, describe is that, that's why we emphasize, I'm sorry, that's why we emphasize removable. Even in the history of the Army Corps, putting in their breakwaters, their reef jetties, their groins, sometimes they have unintended effects. Uh, so uh, we feel the removability allows us to avoid any un by uh, unanticipated effects. But overall, what we are promoting is that we will enhance the bio, uh, the bio culture, the biodiversity, the, the biology. But uh, we do need uh, more uh, to do research and get uh, more 
marine biologists involved, but we feel we will enhance the uh, biology. Great. Um, we've got another question that came in from Margaret asking, there are similar systems designed primarily for habitat lift and they're made from a carbonate composition. How might a titanium structure stimulate growth of marine species? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Uh, part of another research uh, program that we sponsored at Cal Poly was to test uh, the marine growth uh, and biocompatibility of titanium. It is just, it is uh, one of the most biocompatible objects. In fact, it's what we put in our bodies uh, for uh, whether it's a new hip or, or that. Uh, we, um, we compared to plastics. Uh, plastics uh, are, they don't have the structural strength needed for uh, the rigidity requirements uh, for uh, biohabitats. Uh, you mentioned carbonates. I'm going to uh, just jump to concrete. Concrete is expensive and heavy because it would, in my opinion, rely on Portland cement. Uh, uh, so I, I, I think the answer to your question would be that titanium has uh, 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 certain biocompatibility, and yes, the organisms grow on it quickly. That first one, the slide we showed, was growth in only months, and a whole the fish congregated. Um, I'm carrying on, but um, we would like to speak more about the biocompatibility as uh, qualities of this material. And in the end, it becomes least expensive when you consider this project can go for decades and decades. Great, all right. Well, thank you, Coil Reef. Great presentation and great questions. Um, with that, I am pleased to hand it over to our next startup, Ocean Soteria, led by Zach Hooker. Hand it over to you, Zach. Hello, everybody. Okay, we are at Ocean Soteria. So my name is Zach Hooker and I'm a UCSD master's student in mechanical engineering as well as a California native. We're a fast growing group of roboticists and mechatronics engineers with a deep passion for nature and the sustainability of our oceans. Led by myself and UCSD professor Tom Bewley, who holds a PhD from Stanford and is an expert on control and optimization theory and robotics. Our, current, our company is currently developing an urchin population management tool to leverage futuristic technologies such as subsea swarm robotics and inexpensive marine autonomous vehicles outfitted with computer vision and machine learning capabilities. For further context on why urchin management, please let me explain. I grew up diving for red abalone on the north coast. Here's a photo of my family from 05, fresh after a dive in Mendocino. I remember scaling down cliffs on ropes on my dad's back at eight years old to gain access to prime dive spots unreachable by most. It was deep in our tradition for generations to go free diving as deep as we could to pry off abalone in the kelp forest underneath rocks and then celebrate our catch the night of with a big cook off and a party with our closest family, friends and neighbors. We would even make craftsman goods out of these abalone shells, such as furniture and even knife handles. Diving for abalone was one of my major rites of passage into manhood. And then around 2013, we noticed a widespread boom of purple urchin in the water. Shortly after the recreational abalone fishery had shut down for the first time ever, it turned out that there was a rapid decline in the predator caused from a wasting disease triggered an uncontrollable boom in the purple urchin population. I per personally witnessed large coastal areas where these urchin were once in a thriving kelp forest turned into a subsea zombie apocalypse urchin barren void of life and biodiversity. This is why Ocean Soteria was born. We're here to help restore balance to our coastal environment. We found much scientific evidence supporting the inverse relationship between kelp forests and purple urchin populations, as you can see here, with the kelp in the green and the purple blue being the urchins. We have theorized this to be in cause from ocean warming triggering a death by disease of the purple urchins major predator, the sunflower sea star. 
We learned that leading efforts to help curb this global catastrophe are commercial divers smashing them by hand, which is like putting out a wildfire with a water gun. So we asked, how can technology help? Cue the urchinator. Here's the land roaming version before marinization and evolution of a more robust and rugged subsea vehicle meant to systematically cull the purple urchin, utilizing these futuristic technologies such as machine learning and computer vision. With Start Blue, we were able to take a close look at the business aspects of our endeavors, utilizing the triple chasm exercise, and learned that we had made good progress for a maturity level, but we needed to further cultivate our knowledge in the areas of market drivers, regulatory requirements, distribution and sales, manufacturing deployment, and funding and investment. Our initial OKRs were broad, and we realized we needed to have a more targeted approach with our timelines and to further subdivide our objectives and results, as we started off with just dramatically reducing kelp deforestation of our California coastal waters. So we sought out to interview professionals in the industry, such as Nora Eddy, and let her know our mission, uh, who's the Associate Director of the, Natural, the Nature Conservancy, and she appreciated our ethos as divers and thought that in situ culling was a good idea. We spoke with Kristen Elsimore, as well as Derek Stein, kelp scientists partnered with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and they believe that our idea is willing to work and they're willing to help as much as they can. We also spoke with Tom Ford, who leads the Bay Foundation, a world leader on kelp reforestation, and they also said they'd love to provide us with a pilot test site and shared with us that their current cost was 50000 an acre with human divers. We immediately learned that our company strategy was viable and there was immense support of our mission within the kelp reforestation community. We then took a deep dive into the market opportunities surrounding this problem and found that after reviewing marine robotics, marine data science, and even urchin ranching by way of fattening up a cherry picked population of the purple urchin, we found that it was in the best interest of this cause as well as the market opportunity to cull these purple urchins in situ with AVs for approximately $10,000 per acre. So we were then able to get a little bit more targeted with our OKRs. Our first objective being to develop a working prototype by way of testing our remotely operated crawler vehicle in freshwater by the end of the year and complete our computer vision algorithm to coal by January of next year. And then we were able to take a look at our second objective, secure funding for a pilot test site and do that by way of completing applications for $1 million of various funding sources and completing our pitch deck by January of next year. Fast forward for our next steps with Start Blue over the next six months, we thought it'd be good to share our future projected timelines for scaling our goals with the objective to complete pool testing for our prototype by the second quarter of next year and scale from three OVs at the beginning of next year to two. 200 AVs, AUVs by 2027, with the target of a revenue of $20 million annually. We plan to attend all future workshops in the next six months with Star Blue and continue to grow our contact base within the community to help us achieve these goals. So we ask for you guys to support us to keep searching for urchin and answer the call of the wild and reach out if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing and we'd love to learn more about uh, your experience and what advice you might have for our startup as well as potential pilot test sites funding sources and interview candidates thank you very much we'd like to say thank you to also karen and vanessa and john and chris and ken and jordan for all the support as well as our mentors neil and jim so thank you very much any right. question thank you so much zach that was great uh, we'll open it up for Q&A now. Again, everybody feel free to unmute yourself to ask a question or enter it in the chat, and I'm happy to read it out for Zach. Nobody's got a question for Zach and the urchins. Peter, I see you're coming online. Yeah, sorry if I missed it, Zach, but how do you generate revenue again? Yeah, of course. So there is uh, currently carbon credits being allocated to certain uh, conservancies and sanctuaries. And so the goal, and they're currently paying commercial divers to go down with hammers by hand uh, for $50,000 an acre. So our goal is to cut that cost drastically. Thank you. 
but that's to cut the cost. So how would you make the money? Well, uh, a big part of the funding plan is to apply for uh, SBIR loans, as well as other carbon offset grants and funds uh, to catalyst us uh, for the funding. So in the meantime, we're, we're very open for uh, funding sources for this mission. So right now we're working uh, pro bono. Gotcha. Okay. Biggest uh, accomplishment and uh, challenge. Hmm. Yeah, I'd say our biggest accomplishment within this program uh, was outreach uh, to, I think Nora Eddy was was a, a really big advantage um, as she runs, she's a co-author of uh, some of the writings that inspired this project for kelp reforestation. And then again, I'd say biggest challenge would be uh, securing additional funding and navigating funding sources, as well as uh, getting a, a prototype built uh, and uh, presented uh, in a timely fashion, which we're currently working on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Any other final questions for Zach and Ocean Soterio? Um, just a suggestion. Have you thought about going, you know, you did i -Corps. Have you thought about uh, applying and going to i Nationals? Because that's $50,000, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. We um, said, Sounds like we might have a little recommendation. Yeah, that might be just something to think about in 2023. Some of the teams out of your cohort are going into that. Um, you might gain some further insight to customer summary and expand your network. Thank you very much, John. Okay. Vanessa, I have, I have a question. Um, I, I'm not sure I followed the way for continued revenue. But I was wondering, and, and I apologize if I missed this, but I was wondering about if this technology could be made available to um, any uh, government entity or private entity who has an issue with invasive species. And if this could be some uh, uh, a unit that could get sold for use um, by a, a lay person, if you will, to better manage uh, an area that may have an invasive species problem. Yeah, I absolutely. We'd, we'd love for it to grow uh, in, into being more open source, uh, which is kind of the philosophy of our organization. So the idea is to have an inexpensive autonomous vehicle that could be used for gathering ocean data, uh, as well as be deployed in a modular fashion to uh, help, help with other problems like um, invasive species management or uh, data collection. So to answer your question, yes. Great, thanks. Excellent, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach, appreciate it. Um, and I am pleased to introduce our final team that's gonna be presenting this evening, Octopus Seaweed Garden, led by Connor Elliott and Natalie Zembesh. Hand it over to you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Connor Elliott. I'll be presenting today with Natalie Zemsch. We are the co-founders of Octopus Garden, an aquaculture technology company aiming to move aquaculture and seaweed farms offshore. So the idea for our company um, started actually in the teaching lab at Scripps. Natalie and I were lab partners and quickly discovered our shared love for seaweed. Um, following that discovery, we spent most of our time in class not doing classwork and talking about seaweed actually. Um, and from there, our idea for the company really stemmed and we found Start Blue and took the opportunity. Yeah, so um, right now, we're still focused on understanding all the regulations and operating in California. Of them, a lot of regulations, but there are also a few successful aquaculture companies. Um, and we're especially looking at opportunities in Northern California and within the Port of San Diego. Um, and then we're also about to get into UCSD's Makerspace Studios to begin our research and design process. And from there, we'll work to establish a pilot farm and test our outboarding system. 
Yeah, so following up that, um, our idea is to create a technology to meet the growing industry. Um, as you can see on the side of the screen, there's a lot of hype around the seaweed industry today, uh, whether it be for a superfood, biofuels, many other things that we'll talk about in just a second. Um, but our idea going into this was creating a technology to kind of catalyze the growth of the industry as a whole. Um, we were very optimistic as the start, at the start, but we quickly realized that starting a business um, entails a lot more work than we initially thought. One of our classes during this fall module was dedicated to discovering all the different market pathways available to our companies and specifically where our company can fit into those. And I'd say this was really a, a turning point for us. Um, we really started to understand the growing size of the seaweed industry in general and um, all of the different components that make that up. So the photos on the left side of the screen represent um, a collage of some of the areas we considered focusing our technology toward. Um, including seaweed growth for aquariums, uh, regeneration projects, and fertilizers, or just seaweed for food in general. Um, and then on the right are the sectors that we really want to begin working with, which include aquaculture companies and like, shellfish companies, um, and then offshore energy too. So sorry. Um, so our accomplishments so far have really been building up a stronger understanding of how to run a business and be entrepreneurs, which we really had no previous experience with as just marine bio majors. Um, and then also exploring all of those potential markets. That's probably our biggest accomplishment so far. And then lastly, just having incredible networking opportunities, um, both in finding customer discovery and just talking with other people in the blue tech industry. So moving forward in the next module of this class and just in general as a company, um, we need to really continue our customer discovery. Um, that goal kind of goes hand in hand with the second one you see there. Um, by continuing our customer discovery, we can really narrow down what our value proposition will be um, and kind of establish ourselves within a niche. Um, and again, you know, these all are connected. Uh, we really need to focus on R&D. Like we said earlier in the presentation, we're in the makerspace at UCSD um, working on it. So that's a work in progress. And then finally, of course, um, permitting is a huge one here in California that uh, is a bit of a workaround. Um, grants for funding and of course, partnering with other companies uh, is something we're really looking forward to. And of course, we could always use a little bit of your help. Um, we're looking to expand our team currently. Uh, Natalie and I are both marine biology majors. So, you know, a little bit of engineering expertise would be very great. We're looking for a mechanical engineer to help out with that. Material scientist would also be amazing um, just to kind of help lend the knowledge. And we're also always looking to expand our network. Uh, and we also just really want to talk about seaweed and have more conversations. Um, and specifically, we want to form more within the aquaculture industry and offshore energy projects. Um, and we'll end with a final call for you all to incorporate seaweed into your diet. Doing so can help add to this massively growing industry and also give you some of the myriad benefits um, that kelp offers. And here's our contact information down below and QR codes to our LinkedIn profiles. Hopefully they work. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for your time and support during this fall module. And you can take any questions. Thank you, Natalie and Connor. What a great presentation. Um, we have five minutes for your audience to ask questions. So please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or again, enter it in the chat. I'm happy to read it off. Have you guys come across anything that you would consider competitive technology or competitive methods? So I have come across, um, there is limited research in the field regarding to artificial upwelling currently. 
Um, but from what I have found, nothing has focused on aquaculture. It's specifically been to create blooms in the middle of the ocean that would ideally sink carbon. Um, the science there is debatable, but nothing related to aquaculture specifically. Great, thank you, Connor. Any other questions for Natalie and Connor? I just continue to compliment the, your presentation styles. Both of you have done really great job in terms of articulating your story. So, um, you know, that's great. I love the fact that you put some accomplishments that were there. Um, what do you see as your biggest challenge going into 2023? That's how they're getting us to eat more seaweed. <laughs> yeah, um, I think our biggest challenge is actually turning our prototype tangible. Um, and that's where we really want to expand our team um, and get as much advice as possible in like all of the engineering facets of it, because we definitely understand um, the biological uh, challenges and implications of this project, but um, we just really need help building it. Good, good. Um, a customer discovery, how, what's your plans for future customer discovery to sort of guide your business model? Yeah, so for our customer discovery, we, um, one of the markets that Natalie mentioned, offshore energy, um, is a huge target for us right now because that would be established infrastructure that we could build on to test our system. Um, which would kind of be a great workaround for permits because those are so difficult in California. So we're really looking to talk to offshore energy people, um, anyone related to carbon credits, because I think that would be a major source of revenue with our system. Um, so connections within that industry would be great. Then, you know, obviously normal seaweed farms would also be amazing. Okay. Should be a big ask of your mentors. <laughs> Excellent. Any other final questions for Natalie and Connor? All right. Well, thank you, Natalie and Connor. Appreciate your presentations. Thank you. And I will go ahead and wrap up our showcase. So just want to say congratulations to all of our teams and the mentors on really a tremendous amount of work and effort that you've all put forth to get here today. And John as well, and Chris and Karen and Cannon and Jordan, we really appreciate everybody's effort. This showcase is our opportunity to share with our community around Start Blue, the exciting progress they've all made. Um, and now we'll be transitioning to the winter and spring portion of the program for Start Blue, where we'll be getting our teams out of the classroom and into the local blue economy for site visits at different um, companies and at the port and also workshops on funding and SBIR applications and all the tools that they need to continue to grow their business. And we invite all of you to come along with us on this journey. Um, before we close, I'd also like to invite our audience to consider participating as mentors if you're not already, um, or even just signing up for updates on our website. So you can, uh, the QR code right there, will send you there and you can feel free to sign up. We will also be having our big in-person demo day at the end of April. Um, not in June. So uh, we will make sure to invite you all to that. And it will be in person, um, potentially hybrid, uh, big celebration for our teams on their progress. And you'll be hearing more formal pitch presentations from them there as well. And that's when we will open applications for the next cohort of companies um, that will go live. Um, and we will then again, have that um, process through July. So Congratulations again to all of our teams and a huge thank you to all of the mentors, the staff, and all of you that are helping as partners, advisors, and supporters of our program. Um, thank you again for joining us this evening and I'm wishing you all happy, healthy holiday season. So looking forward to seeing you all in person in April and hopefully a lot before then. <laughs> okay. Great job to all the teams. See you next year. <laughs>